Coming up, a secret space plane lands after a two-year mission. Waves of lava are seen on Io. I have an interview with the fit rocket scientist. And I learn about geotransfer orbits. All that and more coming up on this episode of Tomorrow. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Welcome to Orbit 10.18. I am Carrie Ann. With me is Jared and Mike. And we have a whole bunch of things planned for you. Oh, yes. Dada. Dada. I know. I know. Jared Dada. didn't know that I wasn't going to do the Dada thing, and so I apologize. And I also apologize to Dada because I should always point him out. In any case, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the Blue Show. Yes. Uh, at the top of the, <laughs> top of the show, of course, I want to give a huge shout out to our patrons. These are the people who have given us $10 or more for this particular segment of this particular episode. These people are the Escape Velocity patrons, of course. Thank you very much for you and having your name in the show and access to all different kinds of things like Slack channel and Discord channel and uh, whatever else weird happens happenings inside of Ben's head is really what that comes down to. If you would also <laughs> like in the inside of weird happenings inside of Ben's head, feel free to head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Why are you in the background? Thank you. Okay. See, maybe you get to find out why he was doing that. Yeah. Who knows? I don't think anybody knows why oh, Ben does what he does. This is so true, including <laughs> Ben. In any case, uh, normally we would like to start off with launches, but there really weren't any. What uh, the heck, world? Which is Not this week, anyway. Really depressing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, 52 weeks in the year, if there's only like 50 weeks where we launch, I guess that's okay. So, in any case, we're going to talk about some previous launches? I don't know. No, what we're going to talk about is uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. Yes. And, uh, Jared, tell me more about the, J the J-Dub-ST. J-Dub-ST, <laughs> yeah. So, finally, things are starting to come together. It feels like every month we're getting news about it now, not yeah, once a really year. Yeah, which is really exciting. Or, or budgetary congressional hearings about it. <laughs> um, anyways, that's a whole other story. Um, so... The biggest tests yet are coming for JWST, which is that its primary mirror has finally arrived at Johnson Space Center. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is JWST yes. uh, right here. It is huge. It is the size of a tennis court. So um, it's a it's a big, gigantic space telescope. And how, over how, the next, how many football fields is that? How many football fields is that? I, well, uh, one like tennis court is like a two, quarter. It's like a yeah. It's like two tennis courts. But I don't know. Keep going. How many I, I'll Google per... that while you go do it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, over the next few months, the engineers <laughs> are going to install what's known as the primary optical assembly into the largest thermal vacuum chamber in the world for long-term cold testing. Now, in order to bring that thermal ch uh, vacuum chamber down to the temperatures they need to test it at, they're gonna use liquid helium and liquid nitrogen um, because that test chamber has to be dropped down to minus 225 degrees Celsius because that is how cold these instruments are going to be working at. Now, the test is going to last 93 days as a verification for those instruments. And in addition to that, some of the instruments on the primary optical assembly will be tested at their correct temperatures, which are even colder than minus 225 degrees Celsius. Now, the reason that James Webb has to be so cold is because it's an infrared telescope, which requires a complete cool down of all the systems used to gather light. Because if you want to see something in the infrared, your system actually has to be colder than what you're looking at in order to see things. Now, James Webb is looking in the infrared because it's going to look back about 300 million light years further than Hubble. Um, so Hubble can go back about 13.2 billion light years, while uh, James Webb will go about 13.5 billion light years back. So this is the thermal test vacuum chamber, uh, Johnson Space Center. It's the largest of its kind in the world. It's 17 meters in diameter and 27 meters tall. Um, now, even though it is the largest thermal vacuum test chamber in the world, there is still no way to test the James Webb Space Telescope all at once, so they have to test it in little pieces. Um, the only time the system will be tested together as a whole is when it deploys in space. So uh, there's a little bit of nail biting um, going on, especially because acoustic testing last year caught a problem with the system that latches that optical assembly together. And in addition to that, they have a very test 
very, very tight testing timeline, um, but they do have about 19 weeks of margin built into that testing timeline. So they do have some time. If something does need to be fixed, they can actually move ahead with it. Um, now launch is set for October of 2018 on an Ariane 5, and they, are, they specifically chose an Ariane 5 because it offers the largest payload fairing of any rocket out there right now. So in order to get James Webb to actually fit in the payload fairing, they have to do this like folding origami space telescope. Um, and if you ever see videos of the deployment of it, it is absolutely terrifying to think about uh, a $10 billion instrument having to do all of the things that it does. So. They're going to start testing it. This is a very exciting time. We're finally starting to see this extremely long and expensive project coming to fruition. And I'm very excited at the fact that we are now getting one day closer to launch every day. And that is just, I, I can't wait for the data to come back from it. I'm anxious. We've been waiting decades for this to happen. <laughs> so decades and billions of dollars. So yeah. let's do it. Let's make it happen. Billions of dollars. <laughs> what's, what's, what's the, uh, if you were to take... Uh, eight over twelve, and put that down to the smallest fraction. That's what? Not quite. It's two over three. Right, two over three. Yeah. So a tennis court is about two thirds of a football field. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, you're still. That's what you mean. Yep. <laughs> Just okay. In case anybody was wondering, that's what it is. Thanks, Dada. Nice. <laughs> That, that sincerely was like everything I was doing while I'm like Jared's still talking. This is really good. I can try and figure this out. Okay, so brought to you live. Two thirds of a football field. Awesome. Yes, so, uh, Mike, don't give me math during your story, please. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> but do tell me about the X-37B. What's going on yeah. there? So uh, the X-37B, the Air Force's unmanned uh, mini space plane, landed after a two-year mission, and uh, here's some footage of it as well. Whoosh. Yeah. It could be yeah. anything. Yeah, holy cow. No, so this is the one that looks uh, like a mini shuttle, yeah? Kind of? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in just a second here, you're actually going to see it uh, pass in front of a, uh, well, it's just a test shuttle, I think. I believe it's the Enterprise, but it might be the Constitution. I'm not sure which one it is there at the uh, shuttle landing facility. There it is. But this was the fourth mission of the X-37B, and it was the first time that it landed there at the shuttle landing facility at uh, Kennedy Space Center. And it spent 717 days in space, which is now the, the new record for the most amount of time spent uh, for the X-37B. Now, there are two X-37B space planes in existence. This one was the second one, and it's also the second mission that it performed, but the fourth mission overall. And previous missions launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida, but landed at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Cool. Now, officially, the X-37B is meant to test reusable space technologies, and it was originally designed to conduct satellite servicing. But uh, for this mission, the space plane once again broke its own uh, design lifetime of only two 270 days in space, apparently without any problems. Now, the only technology that was disclosed to be tested on this particular mission was a Hall Effect thruster or an ion thruster for Aerojet Rocketdyne. And uh, if we can actually skip forward to uh, the fourth picture here, you can clearly see the, uh, the ion engine next to the more traditional uh, engine nozzle there for a, uh, a liquid system there. So uh, that was the only one they talked about, though. But I mean, I don't know if that, that's the only thing they disclosed for what they were testing for the past <laughs> 717 days. Now, uh, something that they hope to do, landing here at Kennedy Space Center, they, uh, it will enable the Air Force to refurbish the vehicle quickly and prepare for more launches there at Cape Canaveral without having to ship the vehicle cross-country first. So, uh, very cool, and uh, this was cool to see, and I hope that there's more stuff in the future. And I definitely hope that uh, rumors of a bigger version, some people call it the X-37C, actually come, to come out. But uh, in any case, uh, let's see if they get more use out of this secret space plane, whatever its mission is. Yeah, right? That's, yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah exactly. It's funny, though, because that, that last picture, that door is so large, so uh, any sort of rumor of something similar but bigger uh, seems yeah. to be holding at least a little bit of water in that in that sort of sense. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, Jared, you have uh, tweeted out that this is one of your favorite things to talk about. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of people... <laughs> will ask, what's your favorite thing in the solar system? Yeah. And it's not Mars. 
It's not Pluto. I mean, besides Earth. Go yeah, on. Yeah, besides Earth. It's <laughs> the moon, Io. I really love Io um, because it's one of the most geologically active bodies in the solar system. And which moon? This is a moon of The moon water. of Jupiter. Oh, perfect. So, yes. It has over 400 active volcanoes on its surface, which it's about slightly smaller than Earth's moon. So, oh. I mean, that's a lot of volcanoes. Yeah. Per, per, like, per Isn't it true that it's hotter there than even Mercury? Um, it's not quite as hot there um, because of the fact that it doesn't really have an atmosphere to trap the heat in. Oh. Um, but it, it's a very interesting place because it is covered in sulfur and sulfur dioxide. So if you went there and you kind of breathed, it would be very stinky. So we're not vacationing um, there. Yeah, I just wouldn't really recommend it. It's okay. not a very good vacation place. Um, now, it has all of this geological activity because of tidal forces um, from Jupiter's immense gravity pulling on it because Io is one of the closest uh, orbiting moons around Jupiter. And of the four large Galilean moons, it is the closest. It only takes about two days for it to go around Jupiter. Um, now, this is a very cool story uh, that happened actually a while ago, but the research and, and the actual scientific paper just finally came out about it, which is that on March 8th, 2015, Europa passed in front of Io. So what does that mean? That means that there was an occultation, and this occultation... Occultation. Occultation, when yes. one object moves in front of the other. Oh. So it's, it's a nice scientific way of saying things move in front of each other. Like an eclipse. So here's the actual exactly. like imagery okay. from the large binocular telescope Taken in the infrared, so what you're seeing back there is a super bright Io with two very bright areas that are actually lava lakes on the surface of Io. Oh, freaking no way! And then that that you know that dark circle is actually Europa moving between. Huh. Um, now this is especially advantageous for a infrared observation because Europa's surface is made mostly out of water ice, which reflects very little sunlight at infrared wavelengths. So this allows us to make very precise measurements um, in the infrared, which allows us to look at Io's surface geological activity. Mm -hmm. So what we were primarily doing here is we were looking at that bigger of those two bright spots mm -hmm. on Io. Now, it, that's an area called uh, Loki Patera. And Loki Patera is this massive lava lake uh, that is over 21,000 square kilometers in size. It's bigger than Lake Ontario is here on Earth. Now... That totally looks like the way that you described it smelling. Yes. Terrible. <laughs> awful. <laughs> like the worst your father could ever put out, um, yeah. I guess is the way that I would put like it. looks like the, the planet oh, of stinky cheese. It okay. is such a terrible place. And also, by the way, you get about... Uh, 3,600 uh, rems of radiation a day, Whoa. which is like in excess of six times what would kill you in a matter of a couple of hours. Fantastic. So it's not exactly... And most of that radiation is coming from Jupiter, right? Yes, it is. Um, and, and actually it puts out so much material, uh, so many ions from its uh, volcanic eruptions that it, it's made this like torus of ions around Jupiter in and around its orbit, which also... Uh, does not help the radiation out very well. <laughs> so, right. the reason the study was so cool is because this allowed a determination to see if this lava lake, Loki Patera, on Io, mm -hmm. acts similar to lava lakes that we have here on Earth. Mm -hmm. So, and it was found with the results that this lava lake overturns just like lava lakes here on Earth. So, overturns? What is, like, how so? Overturning is when the lava cools mm -hmm. into a crust, and because that crust is denser than the lava below it, it mm -hmm. sinks down into the lava lake oh. and it expose, exposes newer, New lava. fresher lava. Right. Um, so it oh. showed that it overturns just like a lava lake here on Earth. And not only did it overturn just like a lava lake here on Earth, they looked at the temperature across Loki Patera mm -hmm. and they found that it was different on different sides of Loki Patera, hmm. which means that there are waves of lava overturning and they actually started in the middle um, right there and worked their way around that island in Loki Patera and then eventually formed together at the end of the lake where it's a little bit wider um, on the chart right here. So this is the actual temperature chart um, right. from Loki Patera. So it just shows us that the activity of geology that's happening on Io is mm -hmm. extremely similar to what we get here on Earth. Huh. And that's an, that's an awesome result that they were able to pull out of that. Yeah. So, yeah, very cool stuff. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah, I like it. 
<laughs> it's, it still looks like stinky cheese, but it that's is fine. stinky cheese. <laughs> it's very stinky cheese. It's like the blue cheese of planets. Uh, yeah. It's not a planet's moon. So uh, okay, <laughs> I kind of wrap my head around that. Mike, uh, tell me a little bit more about something I can understand. Bring things back to earth a little bit. A yeah. little bit, just a little bit. Let's... <laughs> All right, so um, two astronauts at the International Space Station recently completed the 200th spacewalk, or EVA, extravehicular activity, um, at the space station since uh, it, uh, we've been going there. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was performed by Peggy Whitson and Jack Fisher. Now, uh, for so Jack good. Fisher, this was his first time going on an EVA, but uh, he had a very experienced partner. Uh, this was Peggy Whitson's ninth EVA, or spacewalk. Wow. And she's also the highest uh, female record holder for a amount of time spent uh, spacewalking. She currently, now after this one, holds 57 hours and 35 minutes. Wow. And she's also the first female commander of the International Space Station. So go Peggy. We, we love her, obviously. Totally. We <laughs> love talking about her. But uh, for the work that they were actually doing outside the space station, and by the way, this happened um, on uh, May 4th, uh, and what they, their primary task was to replace an avionics box on one of the express logistics carriers on the S3 truss, which is near the uh, Quest airlock where they first exited the station. And uh, Peggy, after they completed that um, task there, Peggy also installed a feedback loop to test a cooling mechanism on the alpha magnetic spectrometer, while Jack was here installing some antennas to uh, um, downlink HD video to Earth. Um, and then the pair met up at the uh, PMA adapter, or the pressurized mating adapter, that's been moved to the bottom or the Earth-facing side of the station, which will be where commercial crew vehicles will dock. They needed to put some shielding onto the adapter to protect it from debris until they start using it later. They did have other tasks that were planned, but the EVA was cut short because uh, there was a problem with Jack Fisher's uh, suit specifically the cooling mechanism in his suit, and they kind of had to share a system for a little bit before they got back inside. But in any case, uh, the primary task for this EVA was complete, and uh, like I said, this is the 200th mission, and uh, just clocking in more time for Peggy Whitson and also Jack Fisher's first, so very cool. She's yeah. like the American astronaut superstar now. Yeah. You know, she's like yeah. the Michael Jordan <laughs> of American astronauts. Yeah, totally. That's awesome. <laughs> we, she needs to and design I really her like boots. Sorry, go on. <laughs> I was just going to say, I really like this kind of recent trend of it seems like every expedition there's at least one of the astronauts or cosmonauts that kind of gets paid attention more in the mainstream media, and I really like that. So yeah. we're starting to see more and more of these uh, astronaut celebrities, and I really like that. It, ah, yeah, I really like that. It's funny because uh, I do too. However, I my inner uh, the the little Ben implant that he has in my head uh, would probably say something along the lines of, "It is still a little bit too sad, though, that this hasn't become uh, just normal and mainstream enough that this is still a point of interest." Does that make sense? Sort of like you yeah. know it, that it's you know we don't talk about every single pilot unless they do something. Uh, you know, questionable on a United flight, you know, or anything along those lines, that it's not mm -hmm. just, like, normal enough. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's, it's like, yes, but no, but yes, but no kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. <sighs> All right. I had to speak for Ben. Now I've gotten that out of my system. Uh, so, uh, Jared, we already talked about a stinky moon. Yeah. And now, now you're scaring me with this. Why? Supermassive black oh, holes. What's wrong with supermassive black holes? Well, I mean, the song by Muse is fantastic. Yes, it uh, is. But this so. is, these always freak me out, man. Yeah, especially when there's one, uh, you know, kind of on a renegade path. Right. Um, if you think about that it. That doesn't so. sound good. Yeah, so typically oh. you find supermassive black holes at the center of a galaxy. And right. we actually think that supermassive black holes are very important to forming galaxies in the way they are with their very large amounts of gravity. Um, but we just spotted a supermassive black hole in the wrong place. In the wrong place? Place? Yes. Not in our galaxy. This is okay. a galaxy very, very far away. Don't worry. <laughs> really um, freaking but me out. Yes. They use data from the Chandra X-ray telescope, um, which is one of my favorite missions because it just doesn't get so much of the attention that Hubble does, even mm -hmm. though it's one of those great observatories. Right. Um, now, they found a potential candidate for a renegade black hole. Um, now, are you ready for the name of this renegade black hole? Is it Muse? <laughs> no, it's not Muse. Oh. The name of this renegade black <laughs> hole is CXO. J101527.2 plus. What? what? Plus? 6259. One. 
One. Okay. Yes. Here, there's a there's a really Let's great show CXO numbers. called the IT Crowd. That they, yes. Where they debut a, a new emergency number. That's what this sounds like, man. <laughs> like what? What is we happening? Name things so well in this. Br- Br spies in uh in the Twitch channel says I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, in any case, with this black hole, I mean, in, in this other galaxy, is it moving? Is it stationary? What's going on with it? Yeah, yes, so one seriously. of the cool things, first of all, we found it offset from the center of the black hole, which you can actually see in this imagery right here, which mm-hmm. is from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. So uh, it's about 3,000 light years off center, and Hubble was used to take very precise measurements of its velocity, which tells us that it's actually moving independently of the galaxy that it's within. So it's not moving in the same direction that all of the other stars in the galaxy are moving. So scientists are trying to figure out what exactly could cause this, and they think that it is a recoil. So a recoil um, is when two smaller black holes combine together and they make one large supermassive black hole. But what ends up happening is that your gravitational energy, so the thing that makes gravitational waves that we just recently uh, started detecting, um, that gravitational energy does not get distributed symmetrically. It gets distributed primarily in one direction, which then fires off your black hole in the opposite direction. It's like a so, black hole laser? Yeah, kind of. Well, or a bullet. Of, it's like a black hole uh, rubber band. If you think about it, <laughs> okay, you stretch out yeah. the rubber band, you yep. let it go, and it flings off in the opposite direction right. you're stretching it. So it's kind of the same thing here. It's like a uh, gravitational wave rubber band, okay. firing it off in the wrong direction. So, so where is it going? Um, it is. It's going to stay in that galaxy. This galaxy is about 75 million light years away. So okay. we're we're okay. Okay. So, yeah, you don't have no to worry about anything. This. I mean, I'm not so. like inherently worried, but. I just don't like the combination of words. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of does lead to making you feel a little uncomfortable uh-huh. uh, with it there. So. Yeah, renegade black holes sounds very scary. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It sounds it like it's eating up universes as it goes by. Sounds like a sweet, like, like, as punk goes, band, like, you know? <laughs> this is true. Renegade black hole. <laughs> buy our merch in the back. So. Oh, it's such a good thing that Ben's not listening to this segment. Um, yeah. Okay. So, and then, <laughs> oh, man, I am just sweating this entire new segment. Mike, what is so here's going something that on? does concern us. Th- yes, yes. Uh, this does a whole lot. We'll try lot. to keep it quick. This was a big one too. This is huge, so, yeah. huge. Yes. So I definitely don't want to skip it. Tell me what is going on with the space launch yeah, system. Yeah. So here's kind of two big news items regarding the space launch system. And the first one is that whole feasibility study to see if they could, would put astronauts on the very first flight of the space launch system right. has been completed by NASA, and the White House agrees with their results. The results are. There will be no crew on the first flight. No Good. crew on the first flight. Yeah, so a lot of people are happy about that. You know, of course, a lot of people raise objections for safety concerns. But the primary reason isn't safety, it's cost. The reason that the White House was willing to allow NASA to keep its current schedule was because it would cost too much money this late in the planning stage to change the first mission so drastically. They'd have to have a, a, the, a completely different upper stage that they were planning on using for the first time on the second mission, getting all of the launch abort systems ready, getting, you know, just having everything ready, you know. So uh, it, despite that, the, um, the first flight of the space launch system has officially been pushed back to 2019 for multiple reasons including a problem with the core stage that they had this week that might delay things a little bit further. (sighs) What we're talking about is that there apparently has been some damage to one of the the liquid oxygen tanks that are going to be used for all the qualification tests and ongoing tests. I mean, they've already been doing tests with it. Mm -hmm. Now, this comes after a kind of a year-long process where they were holding on constructing new tanks because they were switching the method of welding together these tanks in their vertical welding assembly. Mm Um, to uh, uh, from a new method that they tr- were trying out to an older method that they've previously used and no works. Um, however, they didn't give it, uh, NASA didn't give any info as to how uh, the the bottom or rear of this uh, t- dome of the tank got damaged. And th- this picture that you see on screen isn't the one of the damage. I haven't been able to find any pictures of the tank yeah. actually damaged. But um, the question now is whether or not to repair the tank. 
uh, use the tank, uh, uh, or rather the next tank that's intended for an actual flight to complete the qualification tests or to build a brand new tank altogether to complete these qualification tests. So. What do you guys think that we should do? I mean, I feel like we should just use the next one and, and move on, not try to repair it, and and not build a new one just for qualification tests. Let's just move on and, and uh, start building the next ones. So yeah, that's I think what I'm, I think, but I want to know what you guys think. I'm with you, Mike. A loss is a loss. So, yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on, on how it was damaged, not how, like, you know, what, what the impact was or, or whatever, but, like, you know, in which way it was uh, damaged. Uh, I mean, the, the thing is that if you are even remotely trying to look at reusability on such a thing, that maybe trying to repair and reuse, for lack of a better term, uh, for the qualification might actually, you might learn something in that way. Do you see what I mean? Um, as opposed Absolutely. to... Absolutely. No, I... Yeah, right. I agree with what you're saying, but uh, something that I didn't bring up because uh, there's not really a whole lot of time to go into it, yeah. but they were having problems with this tank already. I brought up the whole welding issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The reason they switched from the new method to the older proven method was because the welds that they had on this qualification tank weren't up to standards. Mm. They would be able to complete the qualification tests for like the amount of stress that they were put under, mm -hmm. but it would definitely would not be suitable to be used as an actual uh, uh, flight hardware tank. Yeah. Um, so... It, it, repairing it is kind of, it, it's just like, okay, well, this still is a faulty tank to begin with. Right, yeah, yeah. No, so no, you're right. It's, it's, I'm, I'm almost, yeah. For sure. It's it's kind of like trying, no, no, no. It's like it's sort of like saying, well, I got new shoelaces on my sneakers, but there's no bottom to them. So, but the, but I have new shoelaces now. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's like you can't, totally <laughs> yeah. understand. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's 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 a super difficult it's, it's one. It's tough. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's, that sucks just all the way around. It is kind of a mess, right? I hope right? you guys watching at home will let us know what you guys think about this, too. Yeah, yeah it is a mess. We could go yeah. into it for quite a while about it, but we don't have time for that today. Yeah. Right, that's right. time for a roundtable discussion. <laughs> yeah, maybe, which should be coming up so. soonish. Yeah, July, yeah. so that's that's exciting. Uh, okay, <laughs> all right, so I still have a lot to digest. I don't know about you guys. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a break. Oh, I didn't mean to digest, to say digest, but I realize that that's slightly punny now uh, because we have on the fit rocket scientist and he's probably going to be talking a little, a little us about nutrition. Uh, so that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean to be punny, but I was. So please forgive me for that. All right. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, Ben is going to have on Kevin De Bruin, uh, the fit rocket scientist. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Tomorrow, live from Station 204. Now, before we get started with our interview, I wanted to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who would help to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We also have our Patreon Orbital subscribers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com. Slash T-M-R-O. All right, we're going to welcome Kevin De Bruyne to Station 204. We're no longer orbiting Planet X. We're actually in Quadrant 8x4 right now. Yep, we're going to a brand new planet. Um, it's actually 8x4G as in glossy. So uh, there you go. Uh, so uh, uh, you are known as the Fit Rocket Scientist online. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. And uh, tell me, first off, where did that uh, name come from? Like, why the Fit Rocket Scientist? Uh, it took me a while to kind of develop it, but I really wanted one phrase that showed all aspects of my life. So Sorry? Fit for Fitness and then yeah. Rocket Science because... I'm a rocket scientist, and I love promoting space. Do you merge the two together at all? Like, I mean, I, you've got the logo on the shirt. Got this guy. Yep, yep, you got yep. that guy. Um, who could so, beat me up uh, in, in no time flat? He, he's nice. He's just got a face of, of grit that shows he's gone through a lot of hard stuff. But then when you get to know him, he's like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so do you, do you focus at all uh, on, like, also staying fit in space? Because I know that that's a potential problem. You know, you go up into space, mm -hmm. and your body starts to kind of decay a little bit. Yeah, that's I, the, I haven't really branched into that one mm -hmm. um, specifically. I've been really interested in it, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what kind of avenue I could go into it. So if you want to actually get people to stay fit and 
you know, be healthier in space, you really need not a rocket science degree, but like uh, biomechanics, bioengineering, something in the human physiology side of things. Yeah. So I got more of the, the personal training, fitness oriented side, but the actual biological responses to space, I don't have an expertise in, but I find it really interesting. So like Scott Kelly, like, one of the cool things about him being in year space, we have so much data to take a look at now, and the ends of his DNA, this is the one thing that fascinated me the most, the ends of his DNA actually got longer while Whoa. he was in space. Yeah, so we think that the aging process is because the strands of DNA get shorter and shorter, and that's why your body ages. But up in space, without the, the gravity, is the hypothesis right now, they're able to stay and actually get longer. But then when he came back down on Earth, they went back to their normal size. Huh. So it's interesting, you could play a little bit off of less gravity and more gravity to kind of prolong your age possibly if you're going out into deep space. Well, that's a really great way to help get space programs funded, say, hey, you'll yeah. live longer. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, yeah. that's incredible, I had no idea that was a thing. Yeah. Uh, you, mentioned, but, you mentioned, oh, go so, ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, just the fitness in space. So yeah, the astronauts have to work out, uh, I think it's a mandatory two hours a day. Mm -hmm. They do their training at, um, I think it's in Houston is where they do all the astronaut training to get going. And I would love to go and chat with those personal trainers, talk to them, heck, put me through astronaut training. I would love to do that. Just see how I do going through exactly what they have to do to get ready to go on to station. I think anyone would love to go through astronaut yeah. training, to be fair, right? <laughs> Very like, well, I've gone through yeah. the training. Why don't you send me just, up just too? Just shoot me, yeah. I'll just go up and well, why don't we try it up there? See how good it was? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so yeah. you, uh, you mentioned school, uh, but we didn't talk about your background at all. Oh, I, know, yes. I know you're from Wisconsin, so as a Minnesotan, I'm yep. hard to hate you. Just so it's, you know. It's no Vikings. Yeah, yeah, you took Brett Favre from us, so. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, so tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, so I got a master's in aerospace engineering mm -hmm. from Georgia Tech. Um, so while I was at Georgia Tech, I did some work with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory on the Europa Clipper mission. So Europe was my baby that's near and dear to me. That's what my college research was in. And I've definitely been keeping up to date with all of the Europa stuff going on. So there's the proposed uh, Europa Lander concept sure. that's supposed to be coming out. Um, it's not officially funded yet, but it's a, an advanced study that NASA's taking a look at. So I keep up to date on all the Europa Clipper stuff, the Europa Lander stuff, and then just all solar system exploration. Let's talk about Europa yeah. for a moment, right? So Europa, mm -hmm. one of the uh, moons of Jupiter. Correct. I almost said one of the planets of Jupiter. That would a be lot weird. of people say that. You know, we just get so excited about it because it's almost more exciting than the planets we have in our solar system. Well, it is, uh, Europa is a really exciting moon. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us a little bit about what makes Europa so Absolutely incredible. All right. Well, Europe is one of the 67 moons of Jupiter. So we got 67 confirmed, zero, confirmed moons around Jupiter right now. It's one of the four Galilean moons discovered by Galileo in 1610 as he was looking through his telescope and saw what looked like a little solar system mm -hmm. in our own solar system. Completely changed the way of thinking at the time. Um, so then he named him Io, is the closest one, the most volcanically active moon in the solar system. Europa, Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system, larger than Mercury, and then Callisto which is seemed to be the oldest body in the solar system due to crater dating. We think it may have come from actually outside the solar system in the scientific community. But Europa, so what's really cool about it is it's about the size of our moon, but has three to four times as much water as all of Earth. So it is essentially a Here. water planet. Essentially a moon. water. What? Moon. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's frozen on the outside because mm -hmm. space is cold. So there's about a 10 to 30 kilometer thick ice shell and then about a 100 kilometer deep ocean and then like a small rocky core is what is believed to be out there. So that 100 kilometer deep ocean is what gives it four times as much water as Earth. Because on Earth we average about three and a half kilometers is the depth of our ocean. Mm -hmm. Even though like 70% of the Earth is covered of it, it only goes down so far. Mm -hmm. So Europa is just a big ball of water that's frozen on the outside out there. And it has the most significant potential for life in our solar system outside of Earth. Now how are we gonna find that, right? Because we, we know uh, life, anywhere we see liquid water, we basically see life, right? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. The liquid water, as you mentioned, on Europa is, what, 10 kilometers below the frozen crust on, on yeah. top. Mm -hmm. 10 kilometers is not insignificant. No. Right? Getting through 10 kilometers of frozen ice yes. to get to the liquid water is not an easy task. So how do we mm -hmm. find life on Europa if we want to do that? Uh, well, the first step is to actually look in the ice itself. So we don't know if the ice is uniform all around. So one of the things for the Clipper mission, its goal is habitability to determine and confirm the habitability of Europa itself. And the lander mission would be a life detecting mission. So the first step is to determine if it's habitable with Clipper, which 99% sure that we're gonna get those results back. And then seeing in the lander actually just going into the ice and they have a depth of about 10 centimeters is what they like to get down to with actually a saw. It's like a, it's a by saw that comes down like this, cuts into the ice 10 centimeters. And they believe that's far enough to get down to get away from the radiation effects and the disposition of Io coming out of Europa's surface to get down there and actually find life in the ice, 
or possibly like small puddle pockets within the ice and stuff that is seeped up in through cracks. Sure. So just by getting 10, 10 centimeters down, they think they can find that ice or it's find, find lot, the life. 10 centimeters is a lot easier than 10 kilometers. It is, yeah. yeah. And uh, NASA doesn't know exactly what the ice is yet. So how do you get through it? Is it going to be soft like butter? Is it going to be easy to cut through? Is it going to be the hardest ice you've ever seen? Mm -hmm. So they have to design saw blades to cut through any type of ice that you find. Oh, I hadn't considered that. So you need different types of saw blades for different types of ice, like the softer ice. I mean, you know, being, yeah. being from the Midwest, I'm familiar with the different types of snow and ice, right? You, sometimes it's uh, really wet snow, sometimes it's very dry snow, sometimes it's really like solid ice and sometimes yeah. it's kind of gushy. Uh, but couldn't you just use the same general blade to get through any of that? I mean, it's still the same general material. Same general material, but then you have to be concerned about are you, like, where is your, your debris going? So when you're sawing down, is it shooting back towards the lander? Is it shooting off to the side? Mm -hmm. Is it actually just creating a puddle of water? Are you spinning too fast and you're making everything sublimate? and you're just creating a little pool. So you, when you take a sample, you want to make sure you hold the integrity of the sample as much as possible. So you need to keep the sample cool while you're actually transplanting it back into the lander itself to put in the instruments. So if you have saw blades that are going too fast and maybe creating too much friction, create too much heat and you're just getting water, you can't be putting water in the instruments. They actually want an, an ice shaping sample themselves. Huh. Yeah. So let's go back. Let's go backwards a little bit to Euro Europa Clipper mission because that yeah. has not yet launched. No. Right. no. So, so tell us a bit about uh, what Europa Clipper is and when, when we can expect to see it. All right. So Europa is a it's a flagship mission that would launch in the early 20s, maybe 2022, 2023, and it's a cylindrical spacecraft that's got huge solar panels on the outside, but like I think it's 90 square meters of solar panels, so like 45 on each side. Whoa. 45 square meters on each side. That's not small. No, it's huge. Yep. All right. Yeah. So since Europa's radiation environment is so intense, they're not actually going to be orbiting Europa. They're going to be orbiting Jupiter. Hmm. So they're going to go into Jupiter orbit, and they're going to do a 14-day orbit around Jupiter with 10 hours of that being as a flyby going by Europa. Are these similar uh, photovoltaics that they had like on the Junos mission? Similar, but not the same. Okay, are they yeah. as large as the, because those were really large too. Larger. Larger. So these will then be the largest photovoltaics we've ever flown. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. And if the lander, when the lander goes through, they will be even larger. <laughs> wow. Okay. So it's huge. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to grab as much sunlight as we can uh, to power it. And mm -hmm. we're orbiting Jupiter and not Europa because of the radiation. Because of the radiation. So the radiation is just going to really kill the electronics of your spacecraft. And we really want to prolong the life of this, this spacecraft. So over the course of two and a half years, it's going to do 45 orbits around. So each orbit is 14 days, 10 hours flying by. And what's really cool is you're actually able to get like global coverage of Europa like you would with an orbiter, but by doing these flybys. So it's a mission design like miracle. It's a masterpiece of what they've done to be able to get like 95, I believe, percent of Europa's surface just by doing 45 different flybys. So they're going to be testing for habitability. So they have like an ice penetrating radar. They're going to try to determine if that ice shell is uniform. If it's not, where are the thin points? If it is uniform, how actually thick is it? Is it the 10 or the 30 kilometers? Um, trying to learn what, what is the salinity of the ocean underneath it as well, because we do believe that it is salt water. But how much, how salty is it? Is it the Dead Sea out there? You know, we hope not, but we do believe it to be some type of brine solution. So because you're orbiting Jupiter, can you do anything else while, while you're doing that that's not related to Europa, or is everything pointed at Europa? Most of the stuff is pointed at Europa. There will be probably some scientific measurements done around Jupiter. But this is the first dedicated Europa mission itself. So we had Galileo and Juno, which is to look at um, the other parts of the, the Jupiter system. And this one's really just focusing on Europa. All right, so now we've got Europa Clipper orbiting. Yep. What's next? It would be the lander. All right. So Europa lander, uh, the baseline in the, the, the report is to launch in 2025. So the interesting thing about that is, is Europa Clipper's mission will not be done um, or will be nearing the end of it its mission at that time. So you're going to be launching a lander and you don't have an exact location on your landing site, which is kind of crazy because you want to use the high resolution images from Europa Clipper to determine where you're going to land on Europa. So we know where the high resolution images are going to be taken from Clipper. So you can kind of narrow down where the spots that Europa lander would most likely land. But the final decision is actually going to be coming in transit of Europa after it launches. So we're doing real time kind of analysis as to where it's going to land Essentially, like, I mean, uh, a couple the years are, before. But uh, the are the computers on board going to be kind of doing some of those decisions as well? No, that's going to be completely, completely on the ground. Okay. So we're going to get the data, NASA's going to get the data from Clipper, analyze it, and then upload what its final targeting position is to Europa Lander. So it's got 
it's, wait 90 minutes for it to accept it. Yeah, yeah. and then send it back. Uh, but what's really cool is one of the landing things for Europa Lander is in the baseline mission, they're talking about a hazard avoidance. So they'd be able to look down, take a picture, see if there's something that's not favorable to land on, and actually then pick a different location on that. But again, yeah. is that from the ground or is that automated? That would be automated. That okay. would be in uh, milliseconds done. Oh, wow. Done in milliseconds. Because that's a lot like when we landed on the moon, right? Uh, Neil Armstrong had to make some real-time decisions because he was like, ah, craters. Yep. And so he was, let's not land there. <laughs> uh, but we had orbiters that looked for these landing zones, and they just missed it. Yeah. So same deal, right? It'll same be able deal. to make real-time decisions. Yeah, but you're not going to have the person in the loop, so this all has to be programmed and automated before launch or in transit, before landing. So you sure. don't have someone at the controls. Well, you go, can't. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. I mean, the delay it's, time is insane. Oh, no. it's uh, So Cassini was that 84 minutes, so we're looking at probably 20 to 40 minutes, depending. Yeah, I don't think you is. can make real-time decisions. But, I mean, you'll yeah. already have you'll either safely be on the surface or crashed within the amount of time that yeah. one command could be sent. As the descent starts, it's six minutes until landing Oh, yeah, on the you don't have it. Yeah, so you're, you you're off. Nothing. You're off by, yeah, many, many, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, and then it's going to land, and it's going to drill through the ice. Saw. What? Go ahead. It's going to saw. So they actually, they looked at drills, they looked at scoops, um, they looked at melting. Like, what sure. is the best way for Lasers. the first lander? Lasers, just yeah. chem cam it, like MSL style. You're going to shark uh, with curiosity. a laser on Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Sharks with lasers yeah, on their heads. Well, that would be kind of awesome. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. What if we find that in Europa's ocean? A shark with a laser on its head? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like. <laughs> I mean, uh, all right, that's Space gonna... fish right there. <laughs> all right. All right. Yep. So uh, saw, not drill. I yep. Use, yep. Okay. You, you think drill just because curiosity, and that's the best way for like coring down in, in ice cores and I didn't and rocks. actually consider that there was something different until, right? I, I just figured, yeah. you know, drilling down, not considering that, oh, no, no, you're going to saw. There is actually a difference between drilling and sawing. So, but yeah, absolutely. So you saw, yeah. and then you, you take the sample. Uh, and then you drop it into the, the analysis. Mm -hmm. Into the, the big metal vault that protects all the electronics that's on the surface. So it looks like a box with a robotic arm with a saw coming out on the end, and it's sure. got like four spider legs that uh, like stabilize it. Because yep. you don't know the, the surface is really chaotic, is what's to believe. We don't have high-resolution high images. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to like land and have no more than like a 30-degree deck tilt so that the instruments inside the vault are going to be able to still operate in the, a nominal procedure up to 30 degrees. And, and then, so we've got this, we've got this data, and then is it able to do, it's a lander, it's not a rover. It's a lander, yep, so no so, wheels yet. Right, no wheel, yet, well, what do you mean by yet? Well, you never know. I mean, everyone wants to move around and do cool stuff. Like, I've heard that James Cameron actually wants uh, NASA to take a picture of Europa's horizon with Jupiter in the background. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. That would be all sorts of that awesome. That would be the coolest picture that has ever existed in the history of life, better than the pale blue dot. I'm sorry, I'm calling it right now. Uh, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Pale blue dot is a pretty great picture. But if we find aliens in this image just walking and just waving, just... Okay, well, that would be better than be pale better. blue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I would say, you know, Juno Cam, I believe, was kind of an after-the-fact, like, tack-on, mm -hmm. and it ends up being, like, one of those really great outreach yeah. objects. And it's how you can, like... It's what the public and, and myself really can like attach to. It's like, yeah. we can see it. That's what's there. Yeah. It's not ones and zeros that are coming down through a communication link. It's an actual physical image. Yeah, yeah, I would love to see a ca Are there currently yeah. no cameras on the lander? Or at least no, no visible light like marking? There's, uh, there's a context imaging suite, which is to be taking panoramic pictures. So you can see those, but they're also for like analyzing where the saw zone is. Um, so there's two of them that are on the back of a high gain antenna. Almost kind of looks like a smiley face which is cool, there's two cameras that'll point down and look around, but they can also go up and rotate around, so then you're getting like a full panoramic of what your horizon line is. But depending on the chaotic terrain, don't know if you'll actually be able to be seeing a big glacier that's in front of you all mm -hmm. around, yep. if you're able to see Jupiter. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens once you get out there. We've got this lander, we've done our first analysis, can we continue to do more analysis after the fact? Like, is this kind of a once and done sort of thing? Uh, obviously oh, we can't mm -hmm. move around, yeah. uh, but can we, you know, a, directly around the lander itself, what can we do? Yeah, so it's got two sampling zones. So it does have a baseline of five samples. So it's taken five different sawing samples. One's right in front of it on the side where the robotic arm is, and then it can actually lift up, go over one of these legs, and sample in this section over to the left. So they want to take five different samples in different sampling zones to determine what is the, like the variability across the, the small space that they have. Now, the lifetime of the mission is quite limited. Um, according to the study, it is 20 days on the surface because it's a primary battery mission. Ah. So there's primary batteries that got power for 20 days. Mm -hmm. um, along with the lander comes its own carrier relay asset, 
um, which is like Clipper without instruments, and the solar panels are twice as big. Or not twice as big, but just a lot bigger, because it's actually orbiting Europa. Okay, yep. So it's only 20 it's, days. It's a relay station, basically. It's a relay station, yep. yeah, and it's only 20 days because the radiation environment just degradates those solar panels like crazy. Sure. That's why they got to be so big. Um, but it would be 20 days on the surface, get those five samples in there, and hopefully be able to detect life within that time. But people are already starting to look at like Lander 3.0 and 4.0, they're testing underwater submarines down in the Arctic, even at the, like, the Los Angeles Aquarium, they're testing some submarines. How do, you, how do you get it there? How do you go through that 10 kilometers or possibly 30 kilometers? We don't know, right? Well, let's, we don't 10, know. let's just say 10, 10. The, yeah. easy, the easy number. How mm -hmm. do you get through 10 kilometers of ice? The two notions that I've heard of is melting, so you melt your way down, yep. and then you deploy, or like taking, like drilling, like almost like tunnel digging, sure. like boring, going down through. But we can't go but, that far on Earth, can we? That's like... Really, really far. It is really, really far. And the thing about it is, too, is once you get down there, like, let's say you go down 10 feet, it's going to be frozen above you. Go down another 10 feet, it's going to freeze again above you. Go down another 10 feet, it's going to freeze again above you. Sure. So you need, actually, like, a physical cable huh. to, yeah. uh, like, a, a docking station on top that's going to act as your antenna. Sure. So you would need a couple different architectural items to be able to get down there, because it's going to keep on freezing as you go down unless you warm the hole itself, yeah. which... Who knows if that's a good idea or not. Um, but to get down underneath that surface, I would say melting kind of seems like the easiest way to go about doing it. Yeah, as long as you don't break that link when you're uh, yeah. going back down. You're a pilot but, from our chat room actually has a really good question, which is, could yeah. you somehow use the ambient radiation around Jupiter to produce electricity? I've heard that question a lot, and it's a very good one. But I have not seen anything that has been developed or devised that could potentially do that really is to protect everything away from that radiation. It's a thought I've had myself. I'm like, if, I could, if we somehow were able to harness that information, anywhere in the solar system, you'd be able to do amazing things with it. Like, just harness the radiation. But nothing that I've seen, uh, I've not seen anything about that. And it's really curious. And I will Destructor 1701 has another interesting comment, uh, which says, uh, melting takes uh, a lot of power. Same deal with boring. Uh, you, yes. You'd have to, like, use a nuke probe or like I mean because you're talking about 20 minutes of power on this lander yeah now imagine 20 having, days. I'm sorry 20 days yep. 20 minutes <laughs> like 20 minutes we're, we're like NASA's got to be doing their stuff real good <laughs> 20 days 20 days 20, <laughs> days. 20 days still is not going to be enough time no. if you have some sort of heating element to get through so you'd have to yeah. do something else from a power standpoint to something make else go. yeah it would be a probably a, a bigger lander that would go there and so the reason well there's a couple reasons um, that the Nuclear option didn't go forward. There were nuclear options proposed in like uh, 2012, and uh, there was a study done in 2014 to just kind of take a look at it um, to see if it would be good, but it's actually come up to be like a lot more mass intensive than what we actually need to do. Um, so the other thought that I had going with this, oh, the plutonium-238 was actually um, like uh, scarce, uh, scarce. Yeah. so there wasn't uh, a lot of it, but it's the... Uh, Department of Energy, or somebody else is going to be manufacturing more plutonium-238. Yeah, so but it's, it's really gonna, hard to make. It right? is it's, really hard to so make. So it's very scarce. We're almost out, but I don't think, it A, I think it takes like years to make that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and B, it's not like once you start making it, you get a stockpile of it. You get very small quantities of it. You do, yeah. But it's, it, it gets you potential for the future. So the lander, if uh, launched, would be in 2025. Wouldn't land until 2031. Then you got to do all this analysis of it. So that's given us, what, 15, 20 years until... Lander 2.0 would go out, maybe 2.0 wouldn't even go through the ice all the way, it would just be maybe a rover at that point. So then think 40 years, 50 years out, when you're actually able to get down into that ocean, we could have enough plutonium by that time to give us the power needed. Mm -hmm. And the technology advancements over the next 40, 50 years could give us that radiation harnessing ability to get that type of power. Uh, our own Jared Head asks, uh, what about the vents of water vapor coming from Europa? Could that be a place to investigate or potentially drop a probe into? Definitely. Um, so they have, Hubble Telescope has saw observations of that in 2012, 2014, and again in 2016. The coolest thing about 2016 is it matches the exact same location as 2014. So now there's repeatability in the exact location of the plumes. So Enceladus, um, the moon of Saturn, Cassini, the spacecraft, has actually flown through those plumes and detected molecular hydrogen. So we've seen and can confirm the plumes are there at Enceladus. It's believed to be at Europa as well, but we don't have any in situ measurements to show us that, yes, the plumes are there and they're happening. All we have is Hubble and Galileo images. Sure. So that would be a great place. We don't know. Um, 
from those images, we can't tell how big the cracks are. Like at Enceladus, you see the tiger stripes, you know that they're a couple, I think it's maybe 20 to 200 kilometers wide, you could maybe drop something in there, but at Europa, we don't have that information yet. So if it's wide enough, that could be a great way to just, you know, get into the ocean without having to melt or drill or bore your way through it. You're clearly very excited about Europa. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is obviously a passion for you. Why? Well, how did you get, why are you so passionate about this? How did you get so excited about it? I honestly, I didn't know what Europa was, never heard the term until halfway through grad school. I was through grad school, like I, I was really focused on, you know, human exploration, space shuttles, moon, Mars, and they're like, hey, there's this project called uh, Europa Clipper that's coming with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And then I saw like NASA JPL, they do robotic exploration, I'm like that's really cool. Let me like research Europa a little bit. Researched it, read about the, the astrobiological significance of it with the water chemistry and energy that's going on for life in our solar system. I'm like, if there's any place that we're gonna find life in our solar system, this is it. And I have a chance to become one of the, like, in this project, at least working on it on an academic level. Sure. And just like fell in love with the science and the, the possibilities there. So I'd, I was an engineer. I was working on designing you know, spaceships, trying to figure out what the best way to go is and find this information is. But I really hit how well with the science. I'm like asking the question is, are we alone? This is the place in our solar system that can give us that answer the quickest. So we had a conversation before the show uh, about um, uh, the type of engineer and what you're expecting an engineer to look like and be like. Yeah. Uh, and you, you mentioned you're an engineer, but when you think engineer, you think uh, more like Big Bang Theory, nerdy glasses, you know, tape around the right. Yeah. So uh, Power wall with style. Are you seeing things. a shift in the type of person that is an engineer, or at least um, is that just a yeah. culture, weird cultural thing that we're uh, a stereotype that we're just. Um, like pushing or what are you seeing from an engineering standpoint? Because I feel like that's not a true representation of engineers, like I, bank theory. Yeah, I think you're hitting it right on the head there. I don't believe it is a true representation. It, it, it amplifies the classical stereotypical engineer, the stuff that you see in the movie Hidden Figures, you know, we were trying to land a man on the moon or put a man in outer space. Like the times have changed. Like engineering and science is now seen as cool to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So some people who like would maybe think it's not as cool, it's, they're, they're more extroverted, they like to have, like, just to go out and do things, it's more, it's, it's not your just stay at home and study all the time, like, someone who couldn't be socially awkward. Like, there's people around that I see that I've interacted with in grad school and in industry that I would not peg them as an engineer. I was like, you seem, you know, you're fun, you're happy, you can have a conversation, you don't look like someone who's got a pocket protector and glasses and is an actual rocket scientist or has a PhD in astrophysics. Like, I wouldn't have pinged him as that. And I think it's a really cool thing that now things are becoming more socially acceptable and actually cool that everybody wants to do this thing. And it's not just for the people who are, um, you know, your classic sure. stereotypical nerds. So are you seeing, you're seeing yeah. the shift of science becoming cool? I mean, are we going to see a point where Europa, the general mass is going to think, mass public is going to be like, yeah, no, life on Europa is cool? Or are they just going to kind of be like, okay, neat. How does this impact me? I would like to go with the, <laughs> with the former. Um, the latter kind of seems like it's a little more possibility. What I see is that actually outside of the United States, it seems to be a lot more exciting mm. than inside the United States itself. So everyone that has interacted with me on social media, not everyone, like I say the majority of the people who are most excited come from foreign countries. They're not always the American side. And maybe it's because we take it for granted, because we have everything else going on. We got MTV, we got football, we got baseball, but the we space. Have some of the world's largest space programs, right? I mean, it's ingrained into our, yeah. uh, uh, just our whole system here in the U.S., right? I mean, NASA's budget from, from a private, I'm sorry, from a non-military space program, NASA's budget is just about equal to the rest of the world combined. Not quite, but pretty darn close. Yeah, but people in America, they just don't know about it. A lot of people back home, maybe you have the same, same experience, they say, NASA, it still exists. Is that our fault? Whose fault is that? Right, because, I, I, because NASA's doing incredible things right now. Yeah, they the are. space shuttle's gone. But, mm -hmm. I, I, and, and this is a whole different conversation, the space shuttle didn't do incredible things, right? The space shuttle got boring. It didn't, the space shuttle's design was, its original concept was to build a space station to send humans to Mars. Never even got close to that. So, but JPL is working on just magnificent projects. Yeah. Mind-boggling, amazing projects. And it feels like 
the, and maybe this is a wrong concept, but it feels like the world doesn't really know about that, or maybe the U.S. Yeah, I, I, I am a, on the same page with you. It feels like they don't know about it. There's not enough exposure. Mm. So, like, when I go out and I, and I talk to kids or, like, I, I tell people about, like, what NASA's doing or, like, what other space communities are, are going on, they are hearing this stuff for the first time. And they're like, wow, that exists? Like, that's awesome. I'm really interested in that. I want to learn more. And I think it's not, I think it's more on, like, the media side in general is the media and society likes to promote um, athletes. They like to promote, um, you know, celebrities of people who I don't really understand become celebrities. Well, how do we um, create scientists to become celebrities? It feels like we're starting to get there, right? We, Bill, Bill Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil, yep. Uh, I would say Stephen Hawking, yep. Professor Brian Cox. Yep. Um, those are the ones that are coming. But you really, it's all at one hand, it, right? Yeah, those right? Are the, Yeah, those are the best ones on one hand. I mean, you got um, the correspondents from Bill Nye show that are, you know, they're, they're younger, they're up and coming. You got Emily Calandrelli. Um, she's an amazing host of Exploration Space. So it's getting out there. Mm. And now with the age of digital media, it is enabling us that we're doing right here to get out there and share space with more people. So now it's a, it's not just relying on the media or NASA to go out and expose and educate others about space. We can now take it in our own hands to go and do that. And I think because so many people are passionate about it, like us, now we're starting to see it climb and increase because now we have the tools and capabilities to go and do it ourselves. So how, how can people watching uh, help get other people excited and passionate about space exploration. It's not just humans in space, right? Yeah. I mean, Europa, uh, the Europa missions are going to be amazing, right? They're going to launch in the early 2020s. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go to a world that could inhabit, that could have alien life, the first time we've ever found alien life off of this planet. Yes. Uh, potentially. I mean, th this is incredible stuff. Yeah. How do we, how do we let the world know that this is, how, how does someone watching live right now go, you know, I want to get the world excited about this stuff. What can I do? What I like to say is like, when you're in love with something, you like to tell people about it. Hmm. So, Talk about it. Tell your friends. Hey, I was watching this YouTube live today, and they're talking about Europa. Have you guys heard about Europa? Tell your friends. Tell your family. Share stuff on social media. That's a big thing that's able to get around. So, like, you share something on Facebook, your friends are going to see it. A lot of people that don't normally get exposed to that kind of space stuff are not going to be able to see that. That's one of the reasons I really love bringing in this fitness side of things, because fitness people don't normally adhere to space science and technology. Yeah. So now I'm able to expose a whole different crowd. So if you have a niche out there that's something not directly into space science, share it to that community. We just need to be broader, spread it around. Is that an around. unfair stereotype? I mean, you, you, think, you think someone uh, that's a fitness buff, you, you generally think, okay, well, they're not gonna care about science. But you're a fitness buff, you care yeah. about science. And I, I feel like, uh, you know, you walk around all these different space companies. You know, here in Southern California, we've got Lots of very large aerospace companies, very true. and it, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem like it's just the middle-aged white uh, fat dude at the desk anymore. It seems a lot yeah. more like younger blood, um, you know, all mm -hmm. over the board spectrum from just everything. Uh, so, is is that a, a fair stereotype? I, I feel like uh, fitness buffs maybe are science buffs too. I a little bit of both. <laughs> I mean, obviously so, you are, right? Yeah, the, I mean, pe the people who are definitely in tune with the science, um, that's great. So they can appreciate another avenue of science. So if you have the science of exercise physiology, biomechanics, whatever mm. it is, they can understand the rocketry, the astrobiology side of things. But a lot of the fitness side you see, and I was this myself back in undergrad, just as your standard meathead. Um, I turned into a meathead for six years in undergrad, <laughs> just lifting weights, you sure. know, eating chicken and rice, just doing it because that's what you see other people doing. Um, and those people don't care. Well, to be general, a lot of them that I've experienced, um, they say, oh, you're a rocket scientist? I'm like, cool. I'm like, dude, we're going to find aliens on Europa. And mm -hmm. they're like, But I eh. think I think you hit the and nail it's... on the head, and I think the structure 1701 uh, in the chat room also kind of tied that together, which is uh, fitness is tied into science, biology, nutrition, et cetera. So maybe, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the way to, to get other people excited is to find their passions. Your passion is fitness. Yes. Uh, so then you, you find, okay, how does science, how does Europa, how does finding other life, they, they all tie, everything ties together somehow. Mm -hmm. How does it tie into fitness and, you know, nutrition and like the science, yeah. even living longer and the science of like uh, what happens to your body in space and how that can translate to here on earth. Yeah. And maybe that's how we tie them in. That and something I probably should have mentioned earlier, how about like all the spin-off technologies that have come from space exploration? Sure. So what your everyday person can do, do you sleep on a Tempur-Pedic mattress? Mm -hmm. That comes from NASA technology. Firefighter gear, that comes from NASA technology. 
grooves in the roads and your tires is NASA technology. Really? How is that NASA? I didn't know that one. So when they were, when they were testing space shuttle tires landing in Virginia, mm -hmm. um, there's a NASA Langley Research Center was testing space shuttle tires landing on runways in the rain. And they're like, how can we improve this process? We're like, we need this to be a safe landing. And they put sliding around a little bit? Yeah, they yeah. put specialized grooves in there. And from that, they're like, you know what? If we put grooves in highways and the water can run off of it, probably be safer for everyday automobiles. Oh. And it actually reduced highway accidents by 85% once they put the grooves in the highways. I assume highway accidents during weather. During weather yeah, time. 85%. Yeah, 85%. Wow, that's incredible. I remember you're actually able to have the runoff. fairly newish too, right? I mean, 20 years yeah. ago, we didn't have grooves in the roads. Uh, no, so that yeah, comes from incredible. NASA technology. So every time you go in your car on the highway while it's raining, you are using NASA technology to have a safer life. Huh. So it's, I guess, bringing, the foref bringing NASA's technology to the forefront of people's ideas or like knowledge that they just don't know about. So the, the trick is figuring out what the other person is passionate about and then yeah. in some way science is tied to that. Yes. I think one of the biggest ones we could do is the selfie camera. The selfie camera. The sensors in the iPhone camera were developed by NASA. Huh. So if you like taking selfies and posting on social media, thank NASA for developing that technology. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I think that can hit by pretty much everybody. <laughs> well, I think it depends on your generation. Well, I think you hit millennials. millennials. I think you hit millennials. millennials. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely incredible. You know, I, I realize we yeah. diverged from Europa quite a bit here. Yeah, we did. Uh, but I think, but... Uh, I, you know, I, th I think the uh, getting people excited about science is, is important because we, we need to get them excited so that they can understand what's going on with Europa and why Europa is a big deal and why the Jovian moons are so incredibly fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, not just Europa, but, you know, like many of them. Yeah. I won't say all of them, but many of them. <laughs> many. There, there, there yeah. are 60 cool. plus, what is it, 60? 60... 67 total moons, four Galilean moons. Yeah, they can't, yeah. All be, they can't all be incredible. That's not allowed. Oh, well, I think they're all incredible. All right, if you start seeing uh, some of the stuff that Cassini has sent back about like Pan, the ravioli moon that we didn't know about in like high definition until we yep. get there, we just got to have Europa, or like Europa Clipper and other missions look at these moons and they're just going to be fascinating. I think, I think they're all extraordinary. All right. extraordinary. I think some will be more extraordinary than others. If I'm they, just saying. The ones that have aliens or... Those or, will be the most extraordinary. Those will be, those will be ones. like the 10 on the scale. Yeah, and yeah. then everything will kind of like fold <laughs> underneath. But some of them could be great for, um, I don't know, nightclubs um, or other things like... <laughs> so there is a distinct possibility that within yeah. our lifetime, we will find alien life, probably uh, microbacteria or microbacteria. Mi mi yeah, yeah, yeah. So mi microorganisms, not like waving arms kind of thing. But, no, not uh, any intelligent life. Correct, um, but alien life, yes. uh, which we have not yet found. Correct. It is possible that we will find alien life in our lifetimes slash potentially within the next 20 years. Yeah. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's what's so exciting about it, is because when that happens, because I have faith, I have confidence that it is gonna happen. We are gonna find that life. and. The rest of the world, hopefully America along too, will change their perception on what it is to be a human. You look at like the pale blue dot is hit with so many people of our significance in this universe is tiny um, compared to everything that else is out there. But if we are the only living thing, you now find something else that is living in our solar system. I really hope it grounds a lot of people to just be more grateful and appreciative of, I could be that microorganism way out there, or I can be a human on planet Earth. And that's what I hope really comes about it. That sounds incredible. That's a brilliant view of the future. Yeah. I'm excited for that. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got uh, a few uh, general questions we'd like to ask all of our guests. Uh, uh, there's no right or wrong answers. So, all right, are first, you sure? Uh, no, I'm not sure. There could be. <laughs> totally could be. All right, uh, all right general questions. Uh, first one, moon or Mars first? Moon. Why? Um, demonstrate the technology closer at home to prove it out so we can get out there. Mm -hmm. I believe even in the new plan that's being laid out by NASA, um, is a stop at the moon first to then go to Mars. And you can also establish a lunar base to then use it as possibly a refueling point or a depot or lunar hotels, hopefully in the future. I would love to, to get stay, out there. I would love to stay at a lunar hotel. Yes. Right, because you can vacation to the moon. Yes. Vacationing to Mars, slightly larger no, commitment. No, you're gonna have to pack a couple lunches for that one because it's like a six month uh, one way trip. <laughs> minimum, minimum, right? Minimum. It could be longer. Yes. Yeah, yeah, depending on when they line up. Uh, would you go? So, to Mars? Or oh, to the moon. The, the question is, would you go? Would you go? I would go to the moon. I would do that, but I would not do Mars. Um, would you ever go to Mars, or would you wait for the indoor plumbing to be ready? Indoor plumbing, yep, and um, Wi-Fi. 
I need Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi there? <laughs> you need Wi-Fi. We've I, talked about that before, yeah. which is you're not going to have the internet. You're going to have to, like, bring the internet with you and then have, yep. like, two versions of the internet that, that like, synchronize <laughs> with each other. Crossing yeah, back. Yeah. That, that's going to be, I mean, p- technically possible, but what a technical feat that will be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess maybe I could go to Mars. I could actually lift heavier weights on Mars because it's oh, only, yeah. like, 30% gravity. Yeah. So, like, everything with, like, my bench, my squat, I could jump higher. That is that the most be... incredible answer to that ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, when do you think humans will first land on Mars? I'm going to say 2050s. 2050s? 2050s right. is, my th- is my thought. When do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? Hopefully. Late 2020s. I want to say before Europa Lander would land. Really? Yeah. All right. All I right. want to say, because if we want to get to Mars yep. in 2030, or 2050s, just to get humans back to the moon and then start demonstrating technology, I want to see that in, in the 2020s, later 2020s, because I have heard of the, the two people want to fly around the moon with SpaceX like mm-hmm. next year or the year after. Um, so that's flying around, but now we need to land and be able to get people back. So I would see that in the mid-2020s, yeah. Right. yeah mid. Last question. This is my favorite. Ooh. Why space? I love this question so much. Have you heard of the movie October Sky? Uh, no. Yes. No. Yes. Yes, I have apparently. Yes. Okay, so for those of you out there who don't know what October Sky is, it is about a, a young boy in Coldwater, West Virginia named Homer Hickam who sees Sputnik go across the night sky and just gets fascinated by it. Starts building rockets in his basement, tries launching them and blows them up, blows up his parents' fence, creates a whole ruckus in this town, um, but eventually goes on and becomes a NASA engineer training astronauts. So it's based on the, uh, the book Rocket Boys by Homer Hickam. It's a true story. Mm-hmm. And I saw this movie when I was 10 years old in my parents' living room, sitting pretzel-legged on the carpet, just awestruck by this movie. And it was the defining moment in my life that I knew I wanted to design spaceships when I got older. So at age 10, I saw that movie. I was like, wow, like, that's amazing. So whenever it got tough in college or work is hard or I'm just like less motivated, I will watch that movie and my inspiration just immediately shoots back up. And that's my rock. That's the reason I'm here doing what I'm doing. That's incredible. I hope, yeah. I hope other people can help find their rock when it comes to uh, exploration of the cosmos. Because, uh, you, know, you know, as Carl Sagan said, we're all made of star stuff. So we're all just trying to go home. <laughs> Right. Very so, true. Uh, absolutely incredible yeah. interview. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday. Uh, this has been an oh. absolute delight. Thank uh, you. you this know, has one, been one awesome. last question. Uh, uh, the chat room was asking, and you need to be a little bit careful in how you answer this. We didn't actually truly cover where you work. Um, so, what is the uh. best way to uh, kind of give your credentials uh, on the show? All right. Um, how I pay my bills? Uh, we will say how I pay my bills is I receive a check from Caltech because I'm actually a NASA engineer for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. All right, cool. But, uh, uh, but comments all and views here are... All of these are opinions of myself. Of yourself, absolutely. Correct. So, all right, there you go. Cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, aerospace engineer, we'll leave it at. You work in yep. the aerospace industry. All right. Yep. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic. Oh, uh, we're, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Close your eyes and picture your favorite city. What do you see? A graceful skyline of towering buildings. Cars and trains bustling everywhere. Crowds of people working, shopping and visiting, maybe for the first time. Tomorrow sees cities a little differently. We see buildings, but also a thriving ecosystem. We hear the cars, the trains, and envision a better way. We see cities as a place to call home, and as a place worth the journey. Cities with a past and a present, but especially a bright future. Come with us and explore the cities of tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our comments from our last show, 
want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We've also got our Orbital patrons. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And our Suborbital patrons. These are people who've contributed $2.50 or more to this episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, because we are a crowdfunded show almost exclusively, Head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. I gotta say, every single dollar helps. Uh, we're, we're doing uh, incredible things. Uh, we're traveling through space, quadrant eight by four G yes. for gloss. Uh, yeah. It's looking a bit glossy out there. Yeah, it's kind of kind of like. <laughs> wow, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll arrive at our new planet in, what is it, two more weeks? Two yeah. more weeks, so something like that. that. Yeah, something like that. All right. So anyhow, uh, yeah, uh, that that's what helps helps fund our travels through space. <laughs> can't even say that with a straight face, can you? Nope. Uh, uh, also, there was no coordination on the all blue situation oh, look at going that. on here. I don't know what mm. happened. We all just woke up with a little blue this morning. Oh, and like Aww. everyone. Even you. Yeah. You're blue as well. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Dutt, are you in nope, blue? Nope, not Dutt. Oh, no, well, Dutt is it's not fine. blue because he, doesn't he count. blew it. God. Wow. <laughs> all right. Wow. Capcom, first comment. Uh, all right. So uh, last uh, preview show's topic, of course, was uh, Mr. Thomas Cheney doing space law and policy. Uh, and we do have at least one of these comments that refers to that. So that's great. It, it Thanks, It wasn't guys. his fault. It was I a bad connection. I didn't say it was. I didn't say it was. It, 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 we're having it, issues with yeah. the holographic projectors. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, Space Mike is. Uh, oh. <laughs> Actually, I can't hear Space Mike at all. Maybe that's just me. There's not. Uh, uh, yeah, it's exactly. not. Uh, all right. It's, all right, all right. It, uh, really? That's so much better. All right, what do you so uh, first oh. comment comes off of YouTube. Uh, this is from Jeff300. I don't know why it's not Jeff3000. It's kind of a missed opportunity mm -hmm. there. Uh, I was watching NRO, NROL 76 and seeing that separation footage alive without knowing it was coming was an incredibly special moment. I doubt I'll ever forget. Me too, dude. Seriously. Yeah. Uh, can we donate uh, Can we donate cameras to other launch providers? I want to see Soyuz upper hot stage like that. Yeah, that mm. was... <laughs> right? Uh, How yeah. awesome hot would that fire. be? Uh, that was incredible. So good. That was inc incredible co coverage. The uh, Universal Camera Site uh, operators uh, definitely earned their uh, their keep that day. Yeah. Yeah. Th those uh -huh. guys, they... Yeah. 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 Those, yeah. It's a yeah. whole lot of boring with like three seconds of interesting. Oh, well, uh, no more than three seconds, but yeah. No, but yeah. I mean, like, the, their entire job is just like, are we launching? No, we're not launching today. All right, want to get, get some coffee? And then it's like, oh, I got it. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> got it. <laughs> You're like, uh, yeah, I earned my keep today. So <laughs> one of the things Tomorrow does want to do someday in the future is bring back our launch coverage, which we used to do during the shuttle era. We would go down, we'd cover the launch. Uh, cover launches and you know before NASA was ever doing high def we did high def launch coverage yep. um, we were interactive before anyone else was interactive and we, we tried to get people excited about the shuttle because it was ending and this was a this is way for you to go ah this is a historic moment <laughs> yeah great, great <laughs> and we're like, like get hey, excited about this you can't have this? anymore no more <laughs> <laughs> but, but good, good you job. know transition them <laughs> to the cool <laughs> <laughs> Transition them to the cool new things that were happening because you know space wasn't dying with the shuttle. In fact, with the shuttle going away, now we can actually start to do amazing, cool things in space. Yeah. We're not just limited to low Earth orbit anymore. Yeah. You just need to give them some time to get these things going. We're not driving a pickup truck anymore. Y yeah, now we're driving a what? Jeep. Jeep. A Jeep. Jeep. <laughs> I'm for it. Oh my god. I say that because they go very slowly. Yeah, they go I'm very okay with slow. that. <laughs> yes, they do. Truck pretty soon. And there's well, nothing wrong with going slow. Uh, I, I think tomorrow could do some epic coverage of launches again, but um, there's a budgetary requirement there because we would have we would want to bring in all of yeah. our own can like do do our own coverage for realsies, long range tracking cameras, uh, on on screen social going on. I mean, just this incredible stuff that we would be able to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't have the budget for it yet. So someday it is actually in one of our line items. You know, we've got all these different shows we're working on tomorrow space, tomorrow science, tomorrow cities, tomorrow tech, um, all of that. And in that, in in that like future plan is rebringing bringing back launch coverage. And yep. I think it would be more than just like regurgitating what other co providers are doing. I mean, it, 
I, I have some interesting ideas. Uh, to get into my crazy brain of interesting ideas, uh, we do have our Discord channel now. Uh, we've moved from Slack to Discord. Uh, two things. One, anyone can join the Discord channel. Yes. So you do not just have to be a patron uh, uh, or um, a scop escape velocity, all the words, escape velocity patron. Anyone can join the general room. Now, we, to get fully into my crazy brain, you do need to be an escape velocity patron. That's where I post all of my updates. That's where you see the stuff. That's where it's wild. It's, that's so. where I give you the crazy ideas of like what the launch coverage would look like, things like that. Uh, so you do need to be an Escape Velocity patron for that, but you can kind of get a general sense of some of these things in the general room. Uh, check our Facebook page or our Twitter account for the link to that Discord channel. All right, there you go. I think I beat that to death. Next up, cat comments. <laughs> the next one comes off of YouTube. Longtime commenter Fabio Milan mm. says, uh, NASA should send Vax to the International Space Station to test his hardware. I'm sure he would love the opportunity. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, just Vax would. loving the opportunity? Yes. I think the rest of us would love the opportunity. We just could, can we send the hologram based, up? Yeah. It's be easy. Sure. Just simply based on the <laughs> idea of like seeing Vax's hair and beard floating like everywhere. Matt, he just did just start. <laughs> Like he would look more like Doc Brown that's somehow. A, yes, I, which is impressive. <laughs> it's yeah. very impressive. I, that, that would I'm be sure, so cool. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm sure he won't say no. Right. I was waiting for him to comment, but I don't see him in the room. Yeah, is uh, he in there? Yeah, uh, I'm sure he is. Not that I know of. Oh, all right. Anyhow, all right. next up. Uh, next one comes off of YouTube. Uh, this is from <laughs> Giddy Giddy. Pff, I can do it. Gideon Nibblesick. Nibelsic, Nibelsic, uh, says the 36 mission time of the Ariane 5 ECA for a geotransfer orbit, is that yep. what GTO is? Mm -hmm. uh, mission mm -hmm. is remarkably yep. quick. This is due to the Good fact job. that the Ariane, thank you, Ariane 5 ECA does not go into parking orbit because of the HM7B engines on the upper stage are not capable of restarting, so they have to do a single burn geotransfer orbit injection. No other launcher is capable of doing this. Yeah, uh, that... I understood half of that. Uh, all right, so uh, <laughs> Hologram, would you like to explain what's going on there? I would, and uh, you are right that this is a, uh, a remarkably quick geosynchronary transfer orbit injection. However, it is not the only launcher that is capable of doing this. <gasps> um, it might be the only launcher today that does do that mission. However, the Delta Heavy um, has the same type of flight uh, profile. However, they wait to do their transfer orbits. They get into like a circular orbit first before going into a really wide elliptical orbit for the transfer orbit, and then once the satellite actually gets to the top, the furthest point of that transfer orbit, burns its engine, so it's also in a circular orbit again, but this time in geostationary orbit, uh, traveling at the same speed that the Earth is spinning, so that it's looking down at the same point. Now, the whole thing with this is that it's all about timing. The reason that they are able to do this in 36 minutes is because they wait until they launch, so that when the first stage has burned up all of its fuel, it's placed into a circular orbit, and it's ready to right then to start their burn for the transfer orbit instead of waiting a couple of orbits until they're in the right spot that they want to be in to start that transfer orbit. So it's all about timing. And a lot of the older launchers uh, back in the 60s, uh, the, especially ones that used solid rocket upper stages, used the same type of method of, of having the timing just right, having the launch window just right, so that when the first stage is finished burning, they're in the exact spot they want to be in to start their transfer burn to get into that elliptical transfer orbit. So uh, it is impressive, but it is not the only launcher capable of doing it. Yeah, and to kind of add on to what Sp Space Mike said, there's there's been rumors that there's been a couple NRO missions that have flown on Delta IV heavies out of uh, Cape Canaveral that did a direct injection into geosynchronous orbits. There's nothing confirmed about mm -hmm. that because obviously the information is like nearly non-existent to get it, but there's been a lot where they watch the flight profile of the vehicle and they figure, oh, well, it looks like they actually just did a direct But, but backing up, because you said you understood about half of that, the, the, I mean, explaining what's going on here. Did I explain here, that very well? Well, I, you, explained, I mean, I, you explained what the, the, what the Ariane 5 is doing, but I don't think it was explained what a traditional, like uh, what does a Falcon 9 or what does an Atlas 5 do? 
Okay, so yeah, the the traditional uh, way of doing it would be they would launch into orbit and have uh, get into a circular orbit first in low Earth orbit or medium Earth orbit and go spend a couple of orbits until they're in just the right spot. Like say um, the exact spot that they want to be in as they're going in an orbit, once they get into that circular orbit, the spot they want to be in is behind where they are, so they have to make one complete or almost a complete orbit to get into that spot to do their transit to do their transfer burn. Um, so vehicles like uh, um, the Arion or the Atlas V or the Falcon 9 um, will wait and do a couple of orbits or just a half of an orbit. It really depends on, on what launch window they have. And so like for geosynchronous transfer orbits, like in the webcast that SpaceX does, they'll have that kind of 30, sometimes 40 minute intermission before they show the upper stage uh, separating the payload from it. And that's what, their waiting period before they do, or while they're doing the transfer orbit burn and waiting to be in the right spot to do that burn. So that's kind of the more traditional uh, flight profile now, if you will. But it is possible to do these direct transfer flights like we're talking about. But the reason an Atlas V and a Falcon 9 can even do that is because they can restart their second stage engine. Like mm -hmm. they can they can shut it down, wait for it in orbit until it gets the right part, and then turn it back on and extend down to where it needs to go. We've lost the hologram. Okay, oh, so hologram's on the phone. Uh -oh. Okay, so uh -oh, what? I am You're back. driving my Prius, yep. right? That's a hybrid car. Yes. And I only have so much gas or so much electricity left in my battery or tank. But I'm trying to get my friend home. Yep. Right? And I don't want to just get my friend to their particular like neighborhood. I want to get them to their house, if at yep. all possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm hypermiling, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like as much as I can mm -hmm. to sort of extend, right? Is that Yeah, yeah. You're not mm -hmm. using your accelerator. You're just kind of you're just kind of coast you're you're going downhill until you need to make that exit mm -hmm. and then you're using your power again to get if I were to use the <laughs> The Prius analogy. I know it's a crap analogy, but <laughs> here's the, the way time, I would like, do it. I don't know how else to like. <laughs> so here's the way I would do That's it. Okay. You, you have a certain amount of, f of fuel and energy left in your Prius. Yeah. And you will, and you're not going to get your friend home. You're going to get them within walking distance of their home. Okay. Because the satellite will use some of its fuel to get itself in its final orbit. Okay. So. Um, so, so my friend will. When you get into the neighborhood, you throw your friend out of the Prius. <laughs> so <laughs> that's basically what happens, and then they walk home. But I mean, the, so. the difference. And sometimes here, you spin them out of your Prius. Yes. <laughs> I know, I'm just saying that because, very specifically, this is addressing the idea of whether or not you can re. Or you can burn again, right? That there's a sing there's a single that's burn correct. versus a, a restart. Yeah. 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 So yes. the idea the and idea that's... is that Atlas V or Falcon 9 has the capability of actually shutting the engine down and right. then starting it back up when it's mm -hmm. in the correct point around the Earth to to continue and you know push it into a transfer orbit. Yeah. Okay. The uh, the Ariane 5 does not have that capability. Okay. Uh, so it when it launches, it can start its second stage engine and it has to stay on. Right. Mm -hmm. So as Space Mike mentioned, they need to get that timing exact mm -hmm. because. Uh, they don't have an opportunity to go around the planet, shut off the engine, and then turn it back on and go again. Right. So they have they have one shot to, you know. You only have one shot? That's, yeah. Do not miss I, your yep, chance? Yep, that's yeah. okay, checking. something something opportunity. Uh, okay. All right, I think I, I think I get it. I'm sure the audience is like, duh. Uh, no, but, I don't think. You know, no, 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 I don't think it's everyone. Okay, right? That's okay. I mean, the rocket scientists certainly, but you know, we have more than just rocket scientists watching the show. The rocket so scientists right. certainly. Carrie, there's, there's not an, a rocket scientist. There's another aspect to that as well. It, it, the problem, part of the problem is that you're driving the Prius, which doesn't have as much power as, say, a Tesla. So, you have to drive longer. Right. In order to be able to achieve a circular orbit, whereas if you were in your Tesla you could take off and coast for a bit to get your circular orbit. Right. Right? And then once you get... That is the most adorable thing, Dada. We have like a teeny tiny, just like yeah. barely even the top of her nose. When, once you get to the, to the part of the, the circular orbit now that you want to release your satellite, then you fire off your, your satellite off, to the, off into space to, to your geo, to geosynchronous okay. transfer orbit. Thank you. Thank well, you, Dada. All and right. thank you, baby Dada. That was stupidly. I adorable. wish you guys could have seen where this just, camera. I just wish like, you guys could have seen. All of a sudden, seen. you just get like bangs and eyes and like just the top of a <laughs> and nose. And like his little hand going. <laughs> <laughs> Dada, I'm so sure what good. you said was amazing. I was paying attention to it baby was. Dada. No, it was, and that, that helped me. So thank you. All right, there you go. Next up, Capcom. Uh, okay, so uh, next comment comes off of Facebook. Regenerative, regenerative orbiting says Johnny oh, Boy. Geez. <laughs> yes, in a Tesla. I got it. That, that much I understood. Regen orbiting. Is that like coming through the atmosphere? 
atmosphere with scoops and like, pulling all the oxygen yes. in. Yes. Oh, that it's was on uh, that one of those oh, movies, yeah. the Jupiter. Just, like, uh, use the plasma. Uh, anyway. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Something like that. Uh, this, oh my goodness. Uh, this one comes from I didn't practice this name. Astracius Graham. Ost sure. Right? Sure. All right. Yeah. Uh, saying, uh, this is way more media of an issue than a lot of people think, talking about space law. Due to development uh, due to development times and upfront cost for missions, much, much less orbital transfer time, if you're looking, uh, I can't talk, if we're mining asteroids in the 2030s, hundreds of millions of dollars are going to have to be sunk into vehicles in the very near future. Yeah, I mean, so talking about the idea that we need some of these laws in place so that... Um, you know, if you're investing billions of dollars, you don't want to lose that investment. You right. want to invest billions yeah. of dollars and have someone else just come and take your stuff. Right. Um, you, there are two sides of this particular coin, right? So if you put too much policy in place, you actually make it impossible for us to do this, right? Because we don't right. know what we're doing yet. Right. Because no one's done it. So you, you, you can't know what you're doing because you haven't done it. So. Yeah. Um, I, I'm 50-50 on it. I, I think there does need to be some sort of protection there, but not too much. I guess I'm not 50-50. I think that's exactly what it is. There needs to be some sort of protection, but not too much. Yeah. Right? The companies that are willing to risk the stuff and put the billions of dollars into it deserve to reap those rewards. Um, but at the same time, we can't put so much regulation in place uh, that it prevents us from furthering humanity's exploration into the cosmos. Mm -hmm. How's that? That's Seem fair? Perfect. Everyone agree? Yeah. All right, I, yes. All right yeah, cool. I think yeah. that's fair. Okay. Uh, next comment comes off of YouTube from Moorian. 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 Uh, this was, I want to say, a, a very long uh, comment, but we, we kind of cut part of this out. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's already like a page of text, and right. that's the short part. Yeah, it says, uh, a comment on the Twitch stream got me thinking, it's impossible to shower in space. So what they really mean is it's impossible to shower in microgravity. You could have a regular shower on Earth, uh, Earth shower on a rotating station, but what about a microgravity version? And then they went on to completely describe their thoughts on such a thing. Yeah, hit up our YouTube channel, youtube.com yeah. slash TMRO. You'll be able to read, you just search for Mo Ryan in the mm -hmm. last episode. I keep going to that camera. I search know. for Mo Ryan mm -hmm. in the last episode, and um, you'll be able to read the whole comment and their idea for a, uh, a shower. And I mean, not impossible to shower in space. Difficult, but not impossible. Yeah, you there, was a there was a shower on board a Skylab and Mir. Oh. So. Oh. You just got to be careful because you can suffocate easily. Yes. Um, one, yeah. of the, one of the things that they had is they had a fan at the bottom of the shower that would, mm. that would suck air and it would pull the water down. That makes sense. So It was just, uh, especially on Mir, it was very time prohibitive to set it up and sure. get it ready to go. If we create, so. uh, if we just do a centrifuge though, I mean, oh yeah, that would that would fix it. Problem solved, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, so this is yeah. <laughs> so we were to say, Mike, did he already take your uh, your comment from that one? <laughs> no, yeah, exactly what I was going to say. Like, yeah, problem solved. Normal and shower. And in if, case if anybody you cares, we fixed it. If you Google uh, 2001 uh, zero gravity toilet instructions, you will get a printout of ten instructions, number five of which refers to the shower from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Also, mm -hmm. those are the instructions we have on the bathroom door here at station 204. Yes. yes. Verbatim, by <laughs> yes. the way, the entire sign. Uh, it is all sorts of amazing. So if you ever want to watch the show live and in person and visit our zero G toilet instructions, uh, they're all sorts of incredible. Oh yeah, that's See, amazing. look, it's a happy Pete Conrad in the, in the shower. Yep, yeah, yeah, so. check that out. <laughs> That's really cool. All right, next up, Capcom. Uh, the last comment comes off of YouTube from Smokesail Aquatus. Aquatus. Uh, if or when you hit the goal to have Space Mike join live every week, have him wear a mobile emitter on his arm like the doctor from Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> no, I super you don't understand, man. I'm, I'm going to have to. You don't understand. I have to do that. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I, I will say... Um, uh, so I, I do I do think huh, actually our patronage went down this last month not up, uh, but I do think that by the end of the year if if we maintain current general trends we'll actually be able to reach that level and it should be pretty incredible to bring Space Mike out here. Although I'm tempted to change the reward and instead of bringing him here send him other places right. Let's send mm, him yeah. to ATK and do a broadcast from there. Let's yeah. send him to Cape Canaveral and have him do a broadcast from there. Yeah. Let's send him to all, I mean, whatever. Johnson, yeah. sure, right? Let's send him to cool places, and then maybe he can do the interview segment. I, I, I think 
there's a, a, a lot of untapped potential in what we could do with Space Mike through the holographic system. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I just don't know what makes the most sense. Having said that, uh, I definitely want him here in studio as well because uh, the delay here makes this difficult. So, um, but it is a really cool effect that it's I'm going to be sad to. It's not it's us. It is, oh, oh, Dada has the sign. This is uh, at station 204, there, there is the sign. That is, that is legitimately what we have on our bathroom door. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's it. It's all sorts of incredible. There you go. <laughs> all right, uh, we, uh, uh, that's our show for this week. Uh, next week, we have got Liam Kennedy from ISS Above. Going to be showing off his, he's got a little, uh, uh, what is that, a Raspberry Pi mm -hmm. uh, that uh, tells you when the International Space Station is overhead. Nice. And does some other cool things. And it's, you know, we're talking a little bit about outreach today. Nice. One of the easiest ways to get people started is to be like, there is a structure with six human beings about to fly overhead at 17,500 miles an hour, or for everyone, uh, for everyone not in the United States, 22,000 kilometers per hour. Uh, 28,000. 28,000 kilometers. That's all good. Sorry. So, what, obviously, I'm in the U.S. Metric mix-up. Uh, <laughs> a metric. Nothing bad happens Hashtag when that happens. Hashtag metric mix-up. <laughs> what was the mission? What was the mission? Uh, uh, Mars Climate Orbiter. Boom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Instead oh. of pounds of thrust, they used newtons. And I just double-checked. Whoops. You're wrong. Is it five? Yeah. Oh, yes, there are five, because they only flew two people on the Soyuz yeah. so on the last so, flight. Because Peggy's supposed to come Because Russia's okay. like, we to ain't got no money. To be fair, to be so. fair, it is almost always six now. As of, that was a safe, of this recording. That was a safe, all right, fine. It's five, it's five. <sighs> Thanks. Uh, and actually, right. I was wrong earlier, too. I said that that EVA that uh, Peggy and Jack Fisher did was on May 4th. That was yesterday on Friday. And I don't know. The other I, May 4th. I think I was thinking of when they did, like, preparations or something like that. Yeah. For, I, I, I'm sorry about that, everyone. I got mixed up. That was just yesterday was, on May 12th. It was so, on May 2nd. May 4th. That's so. it, May 2nd. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, that's our show. Uh, remember to join. Uh, oh, thank you, Dada. Uh, that's our show. And also thank you to our ground support <laughs> patrons. This is why we're getting less money each month. Thank you to our ground support patrons because, again, we cannot do this show without you. These are people who have contributed between $1 and $2.49 to this show. Uh, they're going to get access to our Hangouts uh, when we do them quarterly. Uh, and, of course, their name in the show once more. For more information on how you can help us continue to do this show week after week, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. Thank you so much for watching. After Dark is up next. Yep.